Aku and Behemoth are two of the newest types introduced to the Battle Cats. Aku came first in Update 10.8, with a few Aku enemies and stages at first before receiving a massive expansion in 10.9, featuring a whole new main story chapter, called the Aku Realms, which is unlike anything ever seen before. There were also new abilities, mechanics, materials, and of course, new units. Behemoth came a few updates later in Update 11.5, with some farming stages that would later be expanded on with additional stages and a few one-time playable special stages. This trait similarly arrived with new abilities, new mechanics, materials, and units as well. The Aku Realms update was very well received and cemented its place as a welcome addition to the game, while the Behemoth updates led to lots of controversy with mixed opinions on the additions. When it comes to adding a new trait, you could say that Aku succeeded while Behemoth failed. But why did this happen? With the significant additions that the Behemoth update brought, wouldn't you expect it to do as well as the Aku trait? Well, in this video, we're going to take a look at both of these traits in depth, from their mechanics, to their additions, and even just how they were integrated to become part of Battle Cats as a whole. And as a result, we will also find out what makes a good trait in the Battle Cats. This is why Aku is amazing, but Behemoth is bad. The Aku trait sports two different signature abilities. The first is a new shield mechanic which absorbs a set amount of damage before breaking, and then regenerates to a certain amount after the enemy is knocked back. While we have had barriers before in the game, it would be a far cry to call them the same. Barriers on starred aliens require a damage threshold to be met in order to break the barrier in one hit and for good, with anything less than that number doing nothing to the enemy. Aku shields can be chipped down by damage of any value until the health of the shield depletes, and will come back after the enemy is knocked back. Both barriers and shields make the enemy that have them immune from receiving any status effects while they are active. Likewise, both abilities have a similar counter ability from the cat side. Barrier breaker will break the enemy's barrier for good, while shield piercing breaks the Aku shield once but doesn't prevent it from regenerating it afterwards. So what's so good about Aku shields? Well, for one, they add more depth to the game as all abilities do, but what makes Aku shields special is how they appear to just be a better implemented form of the barrier. Barriers were a cool idea for sure when they came out, but actually didn't change much, since all it took was one hit, either high damage or from a barrier breaker unit to remove them, they had a minimal effect on the enemies overall. With exceptions, of course, to crazy unit stacking on barriers that wouldn't break, but that was more of a fun one-time trick that quickly got old as it appeared multiple times. Aku shields can come back even after being pierced, making sure they are an ability to watch out for, even when you have counter units. Likewise, despite how simple it may seem, barrier can actually be a polarizing ability sometimes. Ultra Baba and Yukan have 266,000 HP on their barriers, and because the vast majority of units in the game do not do 266,000 damage in a single hit, if you happen to not bring any barrier breakers to fight them, the stage becomes physically impossible to beat. However, even if you don't bring a shield piercing unit, you can always wear down and eventually break an Aku shield, preventing this problem from existing. Even if the shield had 1 million HP, you could deal damage to it bit by bit until it eventually fell. Looking at Aku enemies with shields, the way you beat these enemies actually differs from each other, despite having the same ability. For enemies like Ms. Devil, which usually come in groups and have a decently tanky shield but low HP, players tend to just use usual mid-rangers to wear down the shield and kill the enemies. Even though the health of Ms. Devil is heavily weighted towards the shield, the more convenient counter doesn't have to be the shield piercing ability. Other enemies, such as Le Behemoth, who is actually an Aku elephant enemy by the way, and not a Behemoth enemy, because they didn't release Behemoth trait yet, has a very strong shield, and the usual heavy stats across most elephant variants. Shield piercing is a good way to counter it, as doing so allows you to use abilities on it such as knockback, weaken, or freeze. 
Fallen Bear also has a pretty beefy shield with 3 knockbacks, meaning it will regenerate back. Shield Piercing is a great ability to use on this enemy as well, but isn't actually required to beat it, as the shield's HP is low enough to be reasonably worn down by your higher range attackers. As shown by these examples, the Aku Shield is a pretty good ability to add lots of depth to certain enemies. Speaking of Fallen Bear, which we were just discussing, he also happens to have the other signature ability of Aku enemies, being the Death Surge. The Death Surge is an ability unlike anything else in the game, being the first ability in the game to activate upon death. The Death Surge has its own set of custom modifiers like a regular Surge, such as Duration and Spawn Range, but always deals the same amount of damage as the unit it came from. For example, a Fallen Bear at 100% Magnification will have a Surge that does 15,000 damage, while a 100% Sinner Snages Surge will do 2,800 damage. This Surge's damage cannot be weakened, and cannot be stopped from going off once the respective enemy dies. Although this ability always summons a Surge on death, it can still add a lot of depth to the game. Sinner Snage Surges can act as small chip damage to your units, while Condemned Pang and Fallen Bear Surges can act as nukes meant to wipe out your stacks. While you could consider Surge of Units as the go-to hard counter for this ability, it would be impractical to have your entire lineup be composed of only Surge Immune Units, so instead, this ability promotes careful money and cooldown management, which tends to lead to some pretty engaging gameplay. With the Aku trait signature abilities out of the way, let's dive into the signature of Behemoth enemies. Unlike Aku, however, Behemoth didn't really give their enemies a brand new signature ability, but rather operated under a simple principle. All Behemoth enemies will have at least one regular ability, and at least one immunity. Raging Gori resides as the sole exception, but this is due to coming out in the game before the Behemoth trait even came out. Although this idea seems cool on paper, this is actually not quite as good as in practice than theory. Many of the Behemoth enemies tend to have abilities or immunities that don't really do much, and seem to have been slapped on just to continue the trend. For example, Kasui and Ahurujo and Darkjo both have immunity to Surge, despite the fact that there aren't really any main counters to these units that do Surge attacks. Crustaceous Scissorex is immune to waves, except with 1.4 million HP, good standing range, and powerful attacks, I doubt it would have to worry about getting sniped to death by waves. Likewise, Raja Kong is also immune to waves, despite the fact that most Raja Kong counters don't produce waves. Raja Kong also has a wave attack at a 10% chance, despite having an Omni Strike attack already, which just seems excessive to me. The worst offender here might be Tural Hazuku, though as that a Surge Immunity, despite being a backliner enemy that does nuke damage reaching up to 1080 range, with a 20% chance to create a Surge itself, which is really just an RNG middle finger if anything. These abilities and immunities tend to not be required for the enemies to function, and that makes them seem unnecessary. Perhaps the real ability brought by Behemoth is the one exclusive to the side of the cats. Behemoth Slayer is a special ability available on units meant to counter behemoths, such as Egg Units, UL True Forms, and just Stone Evolution Units in general. Behemoth Slayer grants a 2.5 times damage bonus versus behemoths, makes them only take 0.6 times the damage from behemoths, and gives them a 5% chance to dodge the attacks of any behemoth enemy. These are all really powerful effects, though the last part is more of a cherry on top. However, I might not have made something clear about Behemoth in this video yet. Behemoth isn't really a trait, it is actually what is called a sub-trait, because this trait doesn't appear in the cat search filters, and doesn't have any cat units with a specific trait target against it. On paper, it sounds cool that Ponos would try something new for once, and make a whole new style of trait. We've been getting more and more traits since the beginning of this game's release, and they all function similarly so one that activates differently would be a good addition, right? Well, there is one fatal flaw with Behemoth Slayer, and that is the fact that it stacks with other traits and abilities. Let's take a look at the first egg unit you might unlock, Courier Cat. Courier Cat has both Behemoth Slayer and massive damage versus red enemies. Behemoth Slayer increases the damage by 2.5 times, and massive damage increases damage by 3 to 4 times the damage, based on Into the Future Treasures. Assuming we have all of the anti-red into the future treasures, 
This combines to be a 10 times damage multiplier versus red behemoth enemies. As you may realize, this is an incredibly broken damage modifier that essentially allows any unit with these stacked traits to completely demolish their respective behemoth. Aharujo is a red behemoth enemy, which has 1.2 million HP. Courier Cat at just level 30 does 7,055 damage, but with these stacked modifiers, Courier does 70,550 damage per hit to Aharujo. Doing the math, this roughly equates to just 17 hits from Courier's and a little bit of chip. Now, Courier is a low cost, decently fast recharging, and decently fast attacking unit. 17 hits is pretty easy to get, and it requires even less if your Courier is higher than level 30, which is very likely. If you bring out Courier against Aharujo, it's fair to say that he doesn't even get a chance to exist. Aharujo is deleted so fast by Courier that it makes Courier by far and away the best counter for Aharujo and by a landslide. Ponos then realized that this was stupid and in their hasteful judgment decided to make a very poor move. Instead of realizing that this whole interaction was not going to be healthy for the game and changing Behemoth Slayer, they just made sure to give the Behemoth enemies absolutely gargantuan stats so they wouldn't be deleted instantly by Behemoth Slayers. This leads to quite a lot of problems. First of all, while Behemoth Slayer does become incredibly strong with stat-based units, when placed on crowd control-based units, it doesn't help all that much. Surgeon is a good example of this, as its main ability to counter Behemoths is to weaken floating enemies, but its stats are pitiful. Its only main usage is to weaken the respective enemy it's meant to counter, Tural Hazuku, but even then it isn't ideal. Surgeon's terrible stats leaves him not worth using versus anything but Hazuku, to which he still isn't worth using. Even at level 40, Hazuku still one-shots Surgeon, despite having the Behemoth Slayer ability reduce its damage, and its DPS versus Behemoths is still practically non-existent. Octopus Cat remains a much better option for weakening and dealing with Hazuku, as it can survive more hits and just has much better stats that let it handle any other enemies in the stage better. Within the context of Surgeon, Behemoth Slayer essentially does nothing to change its interactions because of its role as a crowd control unit and not as a stat based one. The worst part of all of this is because Behemoth isn't actually a real trait, Surgeon can't redeem itself by weakening any of the other Behemoth enemies in the game. It is stuck solely as a useless unit that isn't practical against any enemy. Due to Surgeon being rather bad, we also now lack a respective Behemoth Slayer counter to Tur'Owl Hazuku, which makes its overpowered stats extremely hard to deal with. This continues to be annoying when dealing with other Behemoth enemies. I am fine with having enemies that don't have an immediate counter, but at the very least they should be balanced and not as overpowered as Hazuku is. Looking at the bigger picture in comparison, however, we can analyze these two traits even deeper. Aku Shields and Death Surges actually expand strategy, as they force players to play differently while fighting them. These two abilities in particular both counter some of the most popular and effective tactics that players use when fighting enemies. With Shields designed to counter crowd control spam, and Death Surge to counter unit stacking strategies. Instead of using the same old strategy that we've used for so many stages already, we are forced to adapt to these abilities and try something new for once. The complete opposite applies to Behemoth and Behemoth Slayer, however. Behemoth Slayer forces you to bring units with this ability to counter Behemoths, or risk being destroyed by the sheer stats of some overpowered Behemoth enemies. You have to bring specifically Courier for Aharujo, or else you are at a massive disadvantage. You will have to bring Mushroom for Rajakong, or True Form Nala for Magamajo, because when they get placed in stages with other deadly enemies, Killing these threats quickly with stacked abilities would be the only way to not die. This forces cookie cutter strategy when you have to bring unit A to counter enemy B, and completely undermines the basis of what makes the gameplay of Battle Cats so phenomenal, which is how dynamic it usually is. The Aku abilities both grow strategy, while the behemoth ones just confine it. Looking at the additional content that came with both the Aku and Behemoth traits, 
we generally see a large disparity in how much Aku and Behemoth content were introduced. Now this may seem obvious, as Aku has been out a lot longer than Behemoth has, but if we just look at only the first three updates after they were introduced each, there is still a noticeable gap. Aku received a much larger amount of content, including more enemies, more stages, a whole new story mode saga, lots of new units, including both drops and ubers, and some advent bosses. Behemoth, on the other hand, received three farming stages with minor expansion stages, the Empress Excavation stages, a few units, and well, that's about it. Empress Excavation itself was just an expansion on Empress Research, which was created originally as Aku content. We can see that a lot more care went into the implementation of Aku than Behemoth, and the results of that show in their reception. Both of these traits weren't released on normal major update times, with Aku releasing on 10.8 and Behemoth on 11.5 instead of a flat update like 11.0 or 12.0, so it's fair to say that they weren't designed to be the biggest poster event out of them all. But alas, Aku managed to be great despite not having as much emphasis as, say, the implementation of aliens with Into the Future and Cats of the Cosmos, while Behemoth ended up being rather controversial which is usually pretty rare for something that would normally be well-liked. Now, I know that development cycles and such are complicated, so in this point I'm not hitting down Behemoth for having less content than Aku, as it simply could have been due to a lack of development focus for this specific edition, especially when you consider Aku became a normal trait, while Behemoth was designed as a sub-trait. But this does further show how great Aku really is as an addition to the game. Looking at the stages specifically, Aku's stages are pretty interesting. Wrath of Hell, which is the Aku Cyclone stage, plays unlike every other Cyclone stage in the game, whereas the previous ones focus on hard crowd control. The Aku shield on this Cyclone prevents that from happening, turning the stage into a DPS brute force oriented one when the shield is active, and then having you use your crowd control options, such as Breaker Blast's knockback when the shield is down. While the boss of Aku Reincarnation doesn't have either of the signature abilities, the stage still manages to be pretty interesting, acting as a late game version of Realm of Carnage, and uses some interesting supporting enemies. Aku's Melody has an interesting boss that also utilizes Aku's shield well, and is a decently enjoyable fight as well. I like the fact that Aku Empress you fight in that stage happens to canonically be the same one who gave you the Empress research missions which is just a nice addition to the lore of Battle Cats, however small it may be. Other minor details like the messages on Aku Researcher's sign are nice, being a reference to Angel Fanboy, and then to Princess Cat in second form. The Aku content is just full of spirit and creativity, which has made it some of my favorite. Overall, I think Aku did really well with each of its additions being pretty fun to play from both a gameplay and idea standpoint. Aku designs are some of the best from a visual standpoint as well. Aku enemies sport a dark blue color scheme, with some additional black and even a bit of yellow sometimes. This already conveys their evil theming pretty well, but Ponos went a step further and gave each Aku enemy themselves a cool touch. Whether it be Sinner Snitch looking like he came fresh out of hell, Condemned Peng rocking somewhat of a demonic cultist outfit, or even something as small as Le Behemoth having the pentagram on his head, these small details really bring out the life in these enemy variants. The original enemies themselves are also incredibly cool. Priest Maimon looks great as an evil leader, and despite not being the hardest boss ever, he was still a cool guy to take down. Gigando is well animated, looking very menacing and cool, and even has small details like the laugh after his attack animation, making him just one of the most visually pleasing enemies to see on the field. Behemoths, on the other hand, have it a bit rougher. Because Behemoth is the descriptor that relates to size, it may be harder to create designs from this. For example, Wild Doge is a behemoth enemy that is the size of all the normal doges, despite being a behemoth enemy. Raja Kong could also be a bit bigger, and doesn't quite feel like what you would get if Angelic Gori became a behemoth. While size is delivered with some of the enemies, like Scizorex and Hazuku, they are all just enemy variants at the end of the day. Ponos may have also been a bit lazy designing the enemies, as they did essentially copy and paste Aharujo to make Dark Joe, and then again to make Megamajo, although to a lesser degree that time. 
the only regular behemoth enemy with an original design that isn't a UL boss is actually Femidisadian Ariant, which in all honesty is a pretty cool enemy. But overall, I think Anku is the clear winner when it comes to designs over behemoths. However, it's time to go into what I believe is the most important part of designing a new trait. More so than the trait signature abilities or even the stages it added, the most important part of making a new trait for the Battle Cat is how it is implemented to fit within the rest of the entire game. A trait could have cool abilities and a decent amount of stages added, but if it is poorly implemented, it can garner a negative reception despite the initial concept being good. To look at how much of a difference this makes, we need to go back in time and look at some of the earliest traits in Battle Cat's history and how they were integrated. Let's go back to the times before Uncanny Legends, before Talents and NP, and compare two other traits, both of which are super iconic today. Let's take a look at how Alien and Zombie were integrated into the Battle Cat. Alien came out in Update 4.0, all the way back in 2015. It would be added in the newly released Stories of Legends subchapters, as well as receiving its own story mode saga in the form of Into the Future. Into the Future itself was a great addition to the story chapters, and felt like it fit right in. Specifically, it was bound so that you could start Into the Future 1 right after you finished Empire of Cats Chapter 3, so you could really play Into the Future instead of grinding Stories of Legend if you wanted to. This now gave the player more options for progressing deeper into the game, as they could choose between Into the Future or Stories of Legend to push. This also was important for making the new anti-alien units viable, as they needed lots of content that included aliens in it for them to be useful. Reflecting on Alien now, it's a type that really always felt like it was in the game since the beginning. One of the most iconic types in Battle Cats, Aliens was integrated extremely well into the Battle Cats, and are now an irreplaceable part of the game. Zombie was released a bit later in Update 5.6, which was in 2016. Zombies were featured in the newest Stories of Legend subchapters as well, and were put in a new mechanic called Outbreaks, which foresaw random empire of cat stages now and then being infested by zombie outbreaks, becoming harder and featuring zombies. The stage would award you 10 cat food on clear and a Z medal, which would increase the treasure drop rate in the area where multiple were collected. Now, this sounds good on paper, but with how these stages were designed, it tended to backfire. Outbreaks were harder than normal stages, and could actually block players out of farming stages for treasures. Likewise, by the time the player was already strong enough to beat these outbreak stages, they most likely had all the treasures, making the increased drop rate redundant. These outbreaks were also much less of a significant content addition than Into the Future, which relegated the new anti-zombie set, Iron Legion, as a less desirable set than most, due to zombies not being prevalent until the late game. With these differences in how types were integrated into the Battle Cats, their receptions were as well. Aliens were very liked for the diversity and presence, while zombies tended to not be liked because of the whole outbreak mechanic. Even though aliens didn't really have a signature ability, and zombie had two very interesting ones being burrow and revive, that didn't stop alien from being the more like trait. Integration is important for making a good trait, because it doesn't matter if the trait is cool and has some interestingly designed enemies, as if the player can't access the content that has these traits, they won't be able to like them. Now we can go back and look at Aku and Behemoth to see how well they were implemented. Aku may be one of the best integrated traits in Battle Cat's history, as it does a lot of things incredibly well. For starters, just like Alien, it introduced another addition to the main story chapters, being the Aku Realms. Since Aku wasn't as big of an addition as Alien was, Aku Realms only consisted of one chapter instead of three. I have to applaud Ponos for what they did with Aku Realms, as it is one of the smartest moves they have ever made for the Battle Cats. So, they wanted to add content that could be accessible by people in all parts of the game. Whether it be early game, mid game, late game, or end game, they wanted players to enjoy some of the new Aku content when it came out, 
and Ponos especially had to take note of this when creating anti-Aku Ubers in the Gacha banners. So what did they do? They introduced the Aku Seal for the Aku Realms, which both disables plus levels on your units and lowers them down to a certain level. Not only is this really cool allowing you to see funny interactions with things like level 1 Awaken Bahamuts and level 1 Can Cans, but it also allows the Aku Realms to be built both for mid-game, late-game, and end-game players. It doesn't matter if your units are actually level 30 or level 50 plus 80, because if you are under the Aku Seal, the level of that seal is the level of your units. This allows Ponos to deliver content to players in multiple parts of the game, with less development time on their own part. This ingenious move may have allowed the Aku additions to have as much content as they did, and also makes for some great gameplay. In the Aku Realms, every time you clear a stage, your seal will increase by 1, allowing your units to be stronger in battle. However, only a few stages are available, and they refresh every 3 hours. Unlike zombie outbreaks, which only saw one stage each, the Aku Realms can have up to 5 different active stages per rotation, which feels like a lot more content to explore than just a simple outbreak. Likewise, unlike most outbreak stages, which are hardly a challenge or memorable at all, the Aku Realms contain some pretty well-designed stages, especially near the end. It is not uncommon for people to have a bit of trouble and remember stages like Easter Island, NASA, Las Vegas, Alaska, Hawaii, and the infamous Mexico, which may have been a little too hard for what it's worth, but I'll give it a pass. Also, the Aku Realms has a much better sense of progression due to making you actually feel like your units are getting more powerful due to the seal's level increasing, and with important stages like Mount Aku, Moon, and Gigondo's Invasion, it definitely feels like an adventure suited for a story mode chapter. All in all, the Aku Realms are pretty amazing for what it's worth, and one of the best content additions to the entirety of the Battle Cats. Even early game players aren't shy of content, with a few early game introductory stages, such as the first stages being built around post EOC 3 levels, and then the Wicked Cat, Tank, and Axe bosses being all a bit later, before you unlock the full Aku Realms. Behemoth, on the other hand, feels incomplete if anything. Behemoth stages are only separate event stages from the main story levels, and are typically farming stages. Hidden Forest of Gapra, Ashvini Desert, and Jin 4 Volcano are where the majority of Behemoth content lie, and even then are just farming stages. The same could be said for Empress Excavations, which simply unlock a unit on the side. The lack of a real end to Behemoth content makes it feel more like some fancy side quest than an actual story objective like Aku Realms is, which takes away from the experience. Another factor that amplifies this fact is that even after you beat the final stage in each map, you will still come back to farm them, which removes any sort of sense of finality for this content. And speaking of farming, I still yet have to talk about Behemoth Stones, which may be the biggest pain out of all their additions. Behemoth stones are farmable materials used to true form eggs into anti-behemoth units and come from the three respective maps. Stones come in different colors denoting their rarity, with red and purple stones being the most common and the fabled yellow stones being the hardest to get. A lot of these stones are required to true form these units, so farming these stages are required. However, unlike most farming stages, these maps are only playable once a day. At most, you will get a few stones each day, but in practice, you might end up missing some of these maps, giving you even less. Although there are Enigma maps that can give you stones, they appear by random chance and are unreliable. Stones being hard to get is a major problem, because it can feel like it takes forever to get the true forms that you want, and at the end of the day, this functions similar to you being denied access to content that you want to play. Even as a late game player myself, beating all of Uncanny Legends, I have yet to get enough stones to true form Super Car Cat, as well as still not having any of the Behemoth Slayers true formed besides Courier, Haniwa, and Mushroom. Behemoth stones are an unfarmable material that needs to be farmed for progression, and this makes them one of the most painful additions. Behemoth stone stages are also not too easy, and can end up being pretty hard at times, such as Jin 4 Volcano Stage 10 which sees you fight Raja Kong with supporting enemies, and Hazuku coming out if you take too long. 
considering that you need to clear 30 farming stages in order to unlock Mushroom. You're presented with dealing this stage without a proper counter to Raja Kong, and this leads to disaster. The stage is incredibly hard and inconsistent to beat without Ubers or Mushroom your very first time, which would be fine if it was designed as some sort of a progression hallmark like Mount Aku is. But instead, it simply gives you access to a unit that assists you in replaying that same stage over and over to farm more stones. This cycle of creating units that are meant to farm their own stages really is what isolates behemoth typing from the rest of the whole game, especially when you consider that this is the only behemoth content you can access until you reach the super late game of UL. Having your content being limited in accessibility is bad enough. But the Behemoth additions take it a step further with one bonus addition that quickly became one of, if not the most hated unit in the entire game. Courier Cat is a unit that is so incredibly broken that it changes how we play the game. I'm not going into too much detail about his stats, because this is a trait analysis video, but just know that they are incredibly busted and allow you to essentially destroy every single red stage in the game without issues, and get carried on a whole lot of other stages. This is impactful to the point where Courier can essentially carry you through the entirety of Stories of Legend, with exceptions of anywhere from a few stages to just one, depending on what you have. Courier comes from Behemoth content, one that already struggles from an accessibility issue, and then amplifies this by rushing players through the game, essentially taking some of the most well-designed and balanced stages in the game, and turning them into something that you won't really remember or enjoy too much. Courier is simply too accessible for the power it holds, as you can get this game destroyer as early as right after Empire of Cats Chapter 3. Although you could make an argument that Stories of Legend became easy once Special Cat Talents came out, at least those require heavy investment and commitment to their strategies and usages. When you invest in Dancer or Dark Laser, they take a heavy amount of NP, and the price you pay is reflected in their power. Courier has a really cheap cost for a true form, and once you get him, he's ready to go delete SOL from out of existence. This is what made him so disliked as a unit, and for fair reasons. While Aku Realms added content to the game, Courier almost felt like he was taking content away from the game, and that is just bad game design in my opinion. Overall. Aku has shown itself to be an amazing trait in many aspects, while Behemoth may be considered as a bad or less than ideal addition to the game. To be frank, I'm not mad at Ponos for adding the Behemoth trait, or the Egg units, or the enemies in the first place. I'm just disappointed that they didn't make any changes to fix these mistakes, mistakes which have already been made in the past. Ponos already knew what happened with the introduction of zombies, they already knew that making weird farming stages like Growing Strange wouldn't be well liked. They already knew how to introduce a balanced and great trait, as they have done so many times. But it seems that Behemoth got the short end of the stick. And it's just kind of sad to see, because Behemoth really had the potential to be something great, even though it wasn't. If we get a new trait in the future, all we can really do is hope that we get another off, and don't get another Behemoth. Well, this was a pretty long one. Thank you for watching this video, especially if you made it this far. As you can tell from my previous video, I'm transitioning my content towards more commentary analysis of the Battle Cats, as I find it enjoyable to do, and think it's a category that is a bit lacking in this community. If you liked the video, leave a like. And if you have any more thoughts on this subject, go ahead and leave a comment for me to read. Subscribe and stay tuned if you like more content like this, because I will be making a lot more content really soon. Also, in the community tab, I'll be hosting some polls on video topics, and you can go vote on whatever sounds the coolest, so I can make content that is more interesting for the viewer, and it also helps me choose one of my many topics to commit to. Anyways, have a good day, and well, this is the end of the video, I guess.